on, on behalf of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics and the Center for Health and Social Sciences, Dr. David Meltzer, David, <laughs> right there, uh, and I welcome you to the fifth lecture in our 2018-19 series on improving value in the U.S. healthcare system. It is now a real pleasure uh, to introduce uh, an old friend and squash buddy, today's speaker, uh, Ralph Muller. R Ralph is Chief Executive Officer at the University of Pennsylvania Health System, a, a world-renowned academic medical center and, and system with hospitals that not only are consistently ranked among, among the top in the U.S., but also are ranked uh, as one of the top employees, um, top 10 employees in the U.S., and listen to this, the second best employer of women among all American companies, um, all American large companies. Uh, the University of Pennsylvania Health System provides comprehensive patient services across six acute care hospitals, multi-specialty care facilities, and home care. Prior to joining the system in 2003, Ralph was, from 1985 to 2001, the president of the University of Chicago Hospital and Health System. Uh, uh, previously, uh, Ralph had been the budget director um, at the university, and before joining the university in the early 1980s, um, Ralph Muller held senior positions with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, serving as deputy commissioner of the Department of Public Welfare. Uh, here in Illinois, before joining the university, Ralph was the chief operating officer responsible for Illinois' state welfare programs, including the Medicaid program. Mr. Muller is director of the National Committee for Quality Assurance, has served as commissioner on the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, as the commissioner of the Joint Commission, as the chair of the Association of American Medical Colleges, chair of the Council of Teaching Hospitals and Health Systems, uh, I could go on and on, and here at the university served for many years as chair of the National Opinion Research Center, NORC. Uh, Ralph is also an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, Ralph's talk today is entitled, as you see up uh, above, Another Cycle, or this time it's different. Please join me in giving uh, a warm welcome to Ralph. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. It's, it's, it's a pleasure uh, to be back. Uh, I was in this room many times over 16, 17 years that I had the pleasure to, to be here and seeing people like you know, doc, Dr. Plonsky and Dr. Meltzer, Dr. Meadow, others here. Uh, we had many, many meetings here. And it was a you know, great pleasure uh, to kind of grow up in a sense at the University of Chicago. I'm still involved at NRC, as Mark uh, mentioned, so I get a chance to come back here uh, very often. And what I was to speak about today, as the title indicates, is you know, we go through cycles in American health care. And uh, many people have pointed out every 20 years, people keep making the same mistakes and they should have remembered from 20 years ago. So I'll, I'll tease you uh, before I give you my answer whether I think it's another cycle or whether it's, it's different this time. Uh, what I'm going to do is kind of look at the national health care scene, talk a little bit about Penn. Hopefully, some of what I talk about at Penn is relevant to University of Chicago, because obviously a lot of my affection is for this, this place. And there's a lot of similarities. One of the things I realized when I went from Chicago to Penn there's about 10, 15 places in the country, whether they're in Boston or Baltimore or Chicago or San Francisco, we're pretty much the same. And in terms of what academic centers look like, you have to vary a little bit, whether you're in Boston or Chicago or San Francisco or Philadelphia or Baltimore, as to what you do. But the kind of classic themes that you know, Dr. Plonsky deals with as a dean and your chairs deal with are very similar to the kind of issues we deal with in, in Philadelphia or at Hopkins or Baltimore or the Mass General. You see San Francisco. So you'll see some of those themes uh, as I evolve uh, what I'm doing here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the pressure on payments. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about affordability. 
and disruption. So this is an important thing to always remember, and I was talking to Dr. Polanski before, you know, how we pay for our health care in America is much different than we do in the countries of the European Union or, many, or Canada or other parts of the world. And systems where those governments pay for health care uh, is much different than us. As you notice here by that gray bar, roughly half of American health care is provided by employers. And that makes, a big, that makes a big difference in how the system operates. As you can see, Medicare and Medicaid add another trillion dollars of, of, of spending but the, the fact that unlike, let's say, Canada or the UK, uh, we have this major private health insurance system has enormous consequences for how the system runs. And when people do cross-national comparisons, if you forget about the fact how American healthcare is financed, you make big mistakes in terms of, I've always said that you cannot take examples from small uh, homogeneous countries like Denmark or, or, or Holland or the state of Vermont and extrapolate them to 50 states in the United States. It's just impossible to do so. And then who, uh, where, where are the costs, uh, who actually provides the care? You can roughly see that half the costs in the American healthcare system go to hospitals and, and physicians. But prescription drugs are at 10% of that and have been a big issue the last six, seven years because they, of all the sectors in, inside this chart, the other one that's been growing the most, which is why you had some issues in the recent election as to what you might do about prescription drug coverage. Now, hospitals are doing less well uh, than they did uh, a few years ago. You can see these operating margins are the jargon by which people like me and Dr. Polanski and others talk, and, uh, um, and um, you know, President O'Keefe talk about these, these kind of uh, things. They're, they're going down. This is a national study from a company that's based in, in Chicago called Navigant. The operating margins are going down around the country. In some ways, uh, this was a deal when we got the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, the basic deal that doctors and hospitals made is if we got more coverage under the Affordable Care Act, we would take price reductions as a way of compensating for the payment of, uh, to cover more patients. Now, the bad news is that these health care costs, rising health care costs, are unsustainable. I would argue, as many people have, a big part of the election of 2016 is essentially the fact that the average person in society has really not gotten a compensation increase the last 20 years, insofar as that person who makes $50,000 has gotten a compensation increase in the last 20 years. It's come in the form of increased health benefits, but they really haven't until maybe the last few months or so really gotten what economists call real increases in, in, in compensation. Healthcare costs are going on this kind of steep curve. As Mark pointed out, uh, I'm still involved in NRC, but you don't have to go to NRC to figure out the curve like this is much steeper than the curve like that. So if costs are going up 200 some percent and, in, and the uh, compensation is going up 50%, there's a big gap in terms of affordability. And this part of the chart is very important. Average American income, fit roughly $50,000, um, the cost of health care, on average, is 15000 Now, 15 against 52 may seem okay, but at, at the poverty level, you're making 24000 If you're working at McDonald's, you're making 15000 Obviously, if it costs 15000 to provide health care coverage, and you're making $15,000, your employer is not very interested in providing you with health care coverage. So a central dilemma in American health care, if it costs $15,000, Who's going to pay for it? Part of what the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, did is to say, we'll give you subsidies to, to cover that $15,000. But that has been a big part of the policy debate the last seven, eight years. How do we pay for health care for the average person in the American population? Now, there's been a quite, this, this is a, the, the Northeast where I'm obviously I'm, I'm based uh, uh, right now. As you can see here, the operating margins are getting pretty low for most of the systems inside the Northeast. Fortunately, we're still up here on the left-hand side uh, doing uh, quite well, and we've been able to sustain the overall enterprise. But by and large, most hospitals in the Northeast, and, and these charts would be the same around uh, the other uh, geographic regions of the country, are having declining margins and in more difficult shape than they were uh, before. Now, the, I've gone over what's happening in the economy the last 20 years and how healthcare costs have gone up. So, we also have a new administration that came into Washington two years ago uh, that ran against Obamacare. The Obama crowd, like the Clinton crowd, and I, as Mark indicated, I've been around a long time, 
You know, they were governmental interventionists. The Clinton people, they brought on Hillary Care, though that never got to pass. Obviously, President Obama brought on what even President Obama calls Obamacare. The current crowd doesn't want government intervention in healthcare. In many ways, what President Trump has done, almost anything that has President Obama's name on it, he's against. So he's been trying to undo Obamacare since he came in. The private sector has figured this out. They're not going to get a lot of intervention from government, in the, except for trying to tear things apart in these two, maybe two more years. So the private sector is kind of coming into healthcare. With uh, the 18% of the US economy being devoted to healthcare, they're kind of coming in. So here are some examples. I'm sorry. You know, the uh, United Healthcare has now employed 20,000 doctors. Again, to go through my, my title slide, is this another cycle? Is this different? Some of us, uh, Mr. Goldbatt here was the chairman of the board when I was here. We know that in the 90s, a lot of big physician aggregations were uh, around the country, and they came and went and had big uh, crashing uh, exits from healthcare. Uh, uh, for those who have been around, like Bill Meadow and Mark and I, things like you know, FICOR, med partners, all kind of crashed and burned. Are, is United Healthcare hiring 20,000 doctors going to know any d different in 2018 than those places who failed at it in 1994, 1995? But by hiring 20,000 doctors, they're obviously making a big bet that they know how to manage physician practices. Amazon and uh, the, the big uh, Berkshire Hathaway and J.P. Morgan, they just announced a new company a few months ago, and they took uh, Dr. Gawande from Harvard and uh, the New Yorker to be the new CEO. I noticed. Uh, he's, he's keeping all his day jobs, so it'll be interesting to see how much he's actually going to do it at this. Signal, one of the big health care uh, insurers in the country, is buying a pharmacy benefit, benefit manager. And CVS, which has you know, 10,000 um, drugstores around the country, I think they, they put out in the press release that essentially they are within 10 miles of 90% of the American population. And they're buying Aetna, which is one of the biggest insurance companies, and they're basically they're going to try to figure out how to put an insurance company into your walk-in strip mall. And, and so that's an interesting business proposition as well. Now, so the question is, with all these entrants from the private sector coming to healthcare, what are they actually going to do? So a, a, a professor at Harvard who's written about d disruptive innovation has taken this example looking at what happened in steel production, where basically the, in the, the, the competitors coming in 20, 30 years ago into steel came in at the low end of the business in terms of rebar and bars and roots, and then in due, due time got into the high end business. Our analogy is, are people coming into the walk-in clinics, the Walgreens, the, the Walmarts, the CVSs, and try to dominate in that kind of walk-in clinic area, and they, can they get into what University of Chicago and Penn do well, you know, into the ICUs and the transplants and the cancer trials? So the question is, is this the way to kind of penetrate health care? Start with the kind of walk-in clinic and primary care and see whether you can move up the so-called advanced medicine ladder, just like it happened. And the question is, is the example in what happened in steel and in those industries relevant to what goes on in healthcare? So it's one of the key questions I'm asking of you today. Now, one thing that people have done, there's been a lot of consolidation. I've written about this uh, with uh, some of my colleagues at Penn who were fortunately for me trained at, at, at here at the University of Chicago. Uh, is getting bigger the answer. Still, 20 years later, the biggest not-for-profit bankruptcy in the U.S. was this Allegheny Health System in Western Pennsylvania 20 years ago. And they got bigger, and they, uh, by 1998, they, they fell um, uh, very big. And uh, so just getting bigger may not be the right answer either in terms of how you deal with this disruption. So what do you do? McKinsey, uh, which is a national consulting firm, that uh, does a lot of work in healthcare, recently put out a paper. And the important thing here is basically the proportions. It says, in the next five, six years, to really bring more value into the American healthcare system, you have to uh, look at efforts at clinical productivity. I'll talk about that in a, in a moment. You have to look at the sites of care, for example, this transition to outpatient retail. This is kind of walk-in clinics, or the fact that, you know, a lot of you now know if you go to Walmart, you can buy generic drugs at Walmart. Walmart doesn't make money by the walk-in clinics. It makes the money by selling you generic drugs. CVS makes the money by walking in and selling you the brand name drugs. So basically, they don't make money in the walk-in clinics. Uh, they, they make money off selling drugs to you. And the question is, is this transition going to be what's going to happen? 
Uh, are there new, for example, one of the things we're proud of at Penn, uh, we've developed this new immunotherapy, uh, which were, uh, that's been shown especially in leukemia and lymphoma to hopefully give lifelong cures. And while it might cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, if you go through three, four rounds of failed chemotherapy, it may cost more. So the question is, are there lifetime cures coming along in terms of new medications, new treatments, and so forth that will save money? Uh, can you bring down the waste and variability in healthcare? One of the not so dirty little secrets about American healthcare, and this is true in Chicago and Philadelphia and every, every place else, there's enormous variation in what we do. So even inside our system, you know, what a surgeon does in one hospital versus another hospital and doing hip or knee uh, replacements, there can be t two to three time variation in costs in terms of what uh, they do. And then the question is, can, you know, big data and uh, AI and so forth. And the important thing here is, you know, like, as Yogi Berra says, it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. It's hard to make predictions in healthcare. But the proportions here that at least McKenzie thinks is that the big opportunities are in clinical productivity and effective care delivery and in these efficiencies. So let me talk now about a very important thing. This is work that comes out of Gallup, and this is similar kind of work has been done by my colleagues over at NORC. And let me, this is consumer trust. At the top of the trust curve in the U.S. is nurses, pharmacists, and doctors. I've discussed this with Dr. Siegler. Doctors used to be the top of this heap. In the last 20 years, I think that physicians are being seen by the American public as getting a little bit too commercial, so they kind of dip below uh, nurses in terms of trust. At the bottom of the heap is your members of Congress, lobbyists, telemarketers, and car salesmen. And the American public, and business, the American public trusts the people inside this room, does not trust Congress, and does not trust you know, insurance companies as well, business executives. So to me, I bet the doctors and nurses and the pharmacists as the people that patients will trust in the future. So some of my skepticism about how much, how disruptive the retailers and the internet and the insurers will be, can they in fact get the doctors and nurses of the future to work in those settings and be the trusted agents on behalf of patients. I remember when I first took my position here, as Mark said, I was president of the hospital here. When I first took uh, the position here, and we were going through one of these waves of disruption in 1986-87, I said to myself, when the big insurers, you know, that time in Chicago, um, Blue Cross, the Michael Reeves Health Plan, United and so forth, when they have the doctors and nurses working for them, rather than the University of Chicago, then I'll get worried. It doesn't mean I, we can be cavalier or smug, but if the doctors and nurses are still working for the University of Chicago hospitals or Penn Medicine and so forth, there's confidence that we'll still win the trust of the American patient. If they move over, as United is trying to do, by hiring 20,000 doctors around the country and start becoming the agents or CVS and Edna, then I'll start worrying a little bit more about what's going on. So my bet is still, as disruptive as these forces will be, the fact that the trust, and obviously, you know, Dr. Seeger has for 25, 30 years now been running the McLean Center here in clinical medical ethics. So, so me, really being on top of that patient relationship is what really makes a difference in terms of where the American people will ultimately vote about how they organize the healthcare system. So what should we do? And so now I'm going to move to the part of my talk as to what uh, and Having been trained as a social scientist, I pay a lot of attention to. Ultimately, institutions like us depend on public trust and, what's, and you have to meet the needs of society. And when you know, I've, I've pointed out in different settings, hospitals in some ways have been around forever. Hospitals go back 600 years. The church goes back a couple thousand years. The church and hospitals and the military are there. The people in the S&P 500 turn over every 20 years. Hospitals are forever. So what you have to do is you have to do what the public needs. And to use a little jargon here now, I'm going to focus on four major categories. Advanced medicine, as you notice, the, the, um, with, uh, the, the Duchess Ross Center for Advanced Medicine, which I was proud to be part of when I was, uh, when I was here as the president of the hospital. In fact, we named it uh, DCAM here, as you know. And I have another version of it in Penn, a different donor with a last name starting with P. So we call it PCAM at Penn versus a, a DCAM. Uh, how to do advanced medicine, how to think about the coordination of care, how to worry about affordability. To go back to my slides, the American population is very worried about how much health care costs. And then 
increasingly we have to mimic some of what the walk-in clinics and other people do in terms of convenience. So let me not go through that. So how to organize around patient populations, how to be patient-facing, how to leverage technology. You know, this, this is probably, in many ways, uh, the most powerful technology in healthcare right now, right here. This has changed more than anything else, how we deliver, deliver healthcare. I'll speak a little bit more about that in, in a moment. And how to innovate, really, in patient care. We can't be smug. Either at the same time, I say, you want to be with the people who have doctors and nurses on their side. You can't be indifferent. You have to keep modernizing as to what you offer to the public. So first of all, we use the phrase uh, at Penn, your life is worth Penn Medicine. And I'm very proud of these are the top uh, honor roll hospitals in the US News. And of all those, uh, these are all 20 hospitals. Uh, our main hospital, which is comparable uh, to your Center for Care and Discovery, which is called the Hospital University of Pennsylvania. This is a ratio of expected to expected deaths. So basically, this says, if you come to a hospital, obviously if you come in with uh, metastatic cancer or liver transplant, your outcome is going to be uh, a little different than if you come in for knee replacement. So uh, they, they do a measure of what's called how many people die compared to what would have happened. So it's the jargon is observed or expected. And if, if the ratio is normalized to one, uh, then you want to be below one. So basically, well, we're, we're at 0.56 at our main hospital and 0.63 at our, our hospital eight blocks away. And even some of the great hospitals in the country, Mass General, Brigham, they're over one. So we're, we're proud of the fact we've really figured out how to bring mortality down in our hospitals through a lot of interventions at the bedside. We have done this through having the classic. This is our main hospital. The, we have a new hospital, so I use the old one here, uh, just like uh, you have uh, the center compared to Billings and, and Mitchell. We have six community hospitals, as Mark indicated in his um, uh, opening uh, introduction. One thing that Dr. Polanski and I learned when we worked together here is you really have to distribute outpatient care, but you have to do it not in walk-in clinics, but through multi-specialty centers. So those who get into medicine develop multi-specialty centers. So, good. so every place, we, I'll show you in a moment, we cover about a 200-mile region, and we have multi-specialty centers everywhere. Ken and I, Kenneth and I developed one in Orland Park 20-some years ago, and when the first week I got to Penn, I said, where are the multi-specialty centers? We've been developing ever, ever since. Our business is 57% outpatient. So at the same time, you have a mental notion of the University of Chicago and Penn Medicine, Mass General, Hopkins, as big hospitals. We're 57% outpatient in terms of dollars. So that the care has moved to the outpatient settings. Uh, we have a big primary care operation as well, because obviously, and one of the things we've done, we've distributed that in that, that 200 mile geography. We've put one of these multi-specialty centers basically at the intersection of every big highway near uh, within 20, 30, 40 miles of, of downtown Penn. And we've gone big time into home care. We're the biggest home care company in the region because increasingly care is being provided inside the home. And our home care is infusion therapy, uh, not, not just uh, you know, uh, coming in to do blood pressure checks. So we've really focused on that end of the, of the, of the business. And good news for us, again, I learned from from NRC, you want this curve to go up. So our activity is going up on the inpatient side and the outpatient side over these years. And also the good news is, since you have to be patient facing, this is the last five, six years, our patient satisfaction, again, you want the slope to go up and we're among the, the national leaders now. Uh, this is a measure, as Dr. Polanski knows, uh, it's very highly correlated outcome. This is like comparable to recommending airlines or restaurants. Are you likely to recommend this to your your friend and neighbor, and, the, and people recommend us to their friends and neighbors. So we have 90% you know, patient satisfaction in terms of likelihood to recommend. And as Mark mentioned, we're very proud of the fact that it, employees who are very happy at work are very good to patients. So we were named the top healthcare employer in the country the last two years. And the second, among all companies, this is universities, healthcare corporations, Google's, Apple's, and Trader Joe's and Wegmans. We're the second best employer of women in the country, top healthcare employer. So we've really focused. And one of the things that we developed here at, at Chicago that I took to Penn is the whole academy. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that, uh, where we basically develop all our staff and train them how to do the right thing. My, my phrase has always been, you teach people on Saturday how to do it on Monday. So we teach people how to 
how to run the ICU. And obviously, it's not literally on a Saturday, but it's a phrase. But you know, I, I learned you know, football teams practice 40 hours a week and play three. Uh, generally, in healthcare, you practice two and play 60. So you had to reverse that ratio a little bit and, and practice a lot more. And I think the way you get great employees and the way you get great patient satisfaction is train people endlessly on everything you want to do. And both the academy here and what we've done at Penn is that endless training. And you know, among the best employers and women in the country. Now, this is, I'm a, I'm a sports fan, as uh, Mark and Stan and other people know. This is a, a map of where there's Phillies fans. And why do I look at that? That's where we're located. Because my thesis is that fandom reflects, and med med medical referrals reflect the cultural values of a region. Now, having grown up in New York and Boston, I knew that the people south of Hartford were Yankee fans and north of Hartford were Red Sox fans. So when I came to healthcare, and that reflected, you know, whether you read the Boston Globe or the New York Times and what department store you went to or, uh, you know, what TV station. In those days, when I grew up, you had over-the-air TV and signal only went 50 miles. So you basically, medicine reflects that as well. So, in fact, when we, I, I, I tell this uh, story inside my, my board, we took over the Lancaster Hospital here. And one of the, in the due diligence, one of the things I made sure before we took it over is that they were Phillies fans rather than Orioles fans because they were even closer to Baltimore Stadium and Johns Hopkins. So we go where there's Phillies fans. And therefore, what we have done is we've taken the 80 miles west of Philadelphia and the 50 miles north. Those of you who know Eastern uh, geography, like Dr. Siegel went to Princeton, north of Princeton, they go to New York. So I, I said to myself, I'm not going to fight against those historical patterns. So we're going to go to Princeton. And so we go to the Jersey Shore. We go 200 miles. This is 200 miles this way, 50 north and south. And so essentially, we have hospitals, and all these dots are outpatient, multi-specialty centers, and so forth, where we have put our practices to really orient ourselves, as Chicago has. Here's a little bit of suggestion for you. And these are the kind of clusters where we do things. And these are our especially in primary care sites. Hold on. This is the heat map of Chicago. Um, now, the trouble is you have all these Cubs fans everywhere, which helps Northwestern a little bit. So, so as I talked to Dr. Polanski, you've got to focus on where these White Sox fans are. And even as Stan Goldbott and I were sharing, there's too many Cubs fans out here where we have summer homes. So this helps your demography here. But to go back to what we've tried to do here is we have clustered our hospitals our outpatient centers and our primary care sites in these areas and having hospital anchors with multi-specialty anchors in primary care in these three ovals is what's helped us to really have that kind of regional geography. And what we've learned is people will travel for cancer therapy. They'll even come in for surgery, but they're not going to come in 20 times for chemotherapy. They're not going to come in 20 times for radiotherapy. And they're not going to come in often for images and so forth. So you basically have to get close to the population. Where we differ from the Rite Aids and the CVSs and so forth, is we put imaging and, and chemotherapy and radiation therapy out there as well, because we know that people would not want to travel 20, 30, 40 times, 50 miles to do that. So that, that kind of regional presence, and it's more difficult in Chicago, but your demography is more difficult here than it is inside of Philadelphia, is basically what's allowed us to get very close to the patients in all these regions. Now, the payers, as I mentioned in one of my early slides, the insurance companies, essentially from the time you leave school to the time you get on Medicare, so roughly from age 20 to age 65, you're going to be covered in health care by your employer. Obamacare has changed that a little bit. And the payers, the big insurance companies, the Blue Crosses, the Aetna's, United, that you have in your backyard here, basically become the agents of patients. And as I noted, they increasingly do not want to pay as much for health care as they've paid in the past. So one of the big experiments in Obamacare was to, quote unquote, to go to more value-based payments. And one of the things I've noted, at both in Chicago and Penn, if in Chicago you've been telling people for 100 years, come to me if you're sick, or Penn for 200 years, come to me if you're sick, guess what you're going to get when you put together an insurance fund? You get a lot of sick people. You can't run an insurance plan if you don't have what's called a normal distribution of patients. So if you're a place that gets sick people, you, don't, you do not want to run an insurance plan because that's what you're going to get. And since a sick person and costs 100 times as much as a healthy person, if you get a lot of sick people in your insurance plan, you're going to go broke pretty fast. 
So just a little inside baseball, you know, a lot of the big systems in the country right now, you know, like uh, Mass General Partners and the system in New York, just doing three, four hundred million dollar write-offs because they got insurance plans. And I said to them, what were you thinking about? If you're Mass General and Hopkins or those kind of places, people are going to come to you if you're sick. You don't want to run an insurance plan, but you want to run as a, a spectrum of care. That, and the way to do that is to, what, what I would say, is, is take risk on what are called bundles. So we've been doing this the last couple of years, and as, as has Chicago, in orthopedic care and cardiac care, where basically we take the accountability after hip replacement, knee replacement, valve replacement, we'll take the responsibility for 90 days of care. So we have to do not just the inpatient setting, the outpatient setting, the home care, but we do 90 days at a time. But by knowing it's going to be a valve replacement, or hip replacement, we basically know what the, the care process is going to be, which is different than just saying, bring me all the people you have in an ACO, and therefore you may get populations that just need hip replacements and knee replacements, and they pay you 7000 a year. You can't get 7000 a year across a whole population. It's all going to be hip replacements and knee replacements. So you have to do it in bundles so you're protected against that. So we've been taking, excuse me, sorry, going the wrong way here. So we've been taking the risk on these various bundles over the last four or five years uh, in Medicare, in Blue Cross, uh, and, and we think that's a way. And in those bundles, we get paid for the hospital care, the doctor's care, the radiology, anesthesia, the surgeon, and I would throw into that new in labs and other things as well. So if you take, to me, I think a way an academic medical center should take risk in insurance is to do it in bundles so you're protected against risk selection. And that's part of what I think has done very well for us. It's a business model rather than getting directly into insurance. And in fact, we signed a contract, our big uh, Blue Cross, like you, is our biggest insurer. And so we did last year, as, as we get paid reasonably well uh, with Blue Cross, is that they were worried about our cost of care. I said, we will take the risk that any patient that gets readmitted to the hospital, we won't charge you for that. Any, and the kind of readmission rate in a commercial population is about 11, 12%. So on 11, 12% of the patients, and what we did is, as we knew enough from my Chicago days and our Penn days to know, the reasons that people get readmitted to the hospital is they don't do the follow-up visit with their primary care physician. They don't take their medications. Uh, they may not have paid attention uh, to what you told them at discharge. A lot of these, so we said, we'll take the risk, and we will put community health workers to follow those patients. We will make sure they get back to see the doctors. We will make sure they're on their medications. So we've learned to do things like text people after the, your, your whole generation now does texting, right? So we text all our patients when they leave. Have you done this? Have you done that? And since we have everybody in the same common electronic record, we can follow everybody constantly as they leave the hospital. And we know that if we send a nurse out to see him or a home care worker out to see him, we know exactly what's going on. So that, that capability, which an insurance company does not have, to stay in help of patients, to re-advise them to monitor their blood pressure, to, re to advise them to go see the primary care physician, to advise them uh, if they need help in paying for their medication. So we send people out either directly or we do it electronically to remind them what to do. By doing that, we have brought down readmissions by 30%, which is the biggest rate in, in the country. And we've done that. And the, part of the jargon in the last four or five years is looking at the social economic determinants of health, and obviously a place like the University of Chicago, which has a broad history in its social science branches of the university, as, as has Penn. We focus a lot on what, what really causes patients to come back in the hospital, and by and large, has less to do with their follow-up medical care and more to do with the social economic conditions. In many ways, here's a trick question. What, What's the best predictor of whether somebody will be readmitted to a hospital? It's their credit score. So the credit score is a good measure of their economic status and their reliability. And, and so you can almost predict whether somebody can be readmitted to a hospital if they have a low credit score, which is a bizarre finding in the world of big data. So not that we just look at that, but we look at other things as well. So looking at those social economic conditions is a big indicator. So what we've done, we have over 60 community health workers that go out and basically hover over at the patients that have been admitted. Because obviously the, the ones are admitted, the ones who are going to be readmitted. So that, by doing that, we have brought down the readmission risk by 30%. And in all patients outside this program, it's 8%. Another important thing as to why we've had the geographic distribution that uh, we've, we've had, uh, that I described on earlier maps, is if you can keep the care inside a system, and this is an important point for those of you who are going into medicine, if you keep the care inside of a system, you can save half the cost. 
patient, this is national data, from the, 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 there's 100 hospitals like us around the country, from Stanford to Harvard to Emory to Seattle. If you keep the care inside of a system, it's half the cost of when people bounce around. And some obvious things are duplicate MRIs and, and CTs and so forth, and misdiagnosis. But if you have integrated care inside a system, you can, this is one of the major findings we've had in our research, as a national research over the last five, six years. Keep the care integrated inside a system, you'll save half the money. And that is how you bend the American cost curve, by keeping care inside a system. So, another important point, if there's two or three slides you pay attention to, remember this one. It's my five and 50 slide. 5% 5 of the population, this is true in Chicago, in Philadelphia, in San Francisco, in Denmark, in Vermont, it's true, in, each, in Europe and the United States, in Medicare and Medicaid. 5% of the population causes 50% of the cost. And one of my criticisms of a lot of the efforts in population health the last few years, they focus too much on healthy 28-year-olds. Now, if all you healthy 28-year-olds did the right thing and listened to your mom and didn't smoke and exercised a bit and slept enough and ate the right diet and so forth, half of you would never have to come see us. But since you don't do that, at age 62 and 72, you come see us. And therefore, you cause, when you get to be 62 and 72 and 82, you cause 50% of the health care costs. And if you don't take a dent at figuring out what to do with that 5%, that costs 50% of the cost, you're not going to bend the American cost curve. In many ways, one of my crit critiques of the Obamacare, they didn't focus enough on this 5%. You have to, whether these are, uh, are preterm uh, births uh, uh, in, um, you know, in, in the NICU that uh, Dr. Meadow used to run, or cancer patients, or heart failure patients, or strokes. If you don't pay attention to what you can do in that 5%, you're not going to bend the American cost curve. And fortunately, we know that the good news and bad news is expensive cases, you know, cancer, strokes, transplants, cost fifty to $150,000. Most of the people inside this room, you don't cost anything. Saving 100% of zero is still zero. So if you, don't, if you don't cost anything at 28 and 30, basically at 32, age 28 and 32, you may have babies and you may have an accident, but basically you don't cost any money. Saving money on you is not going to bend the American cost curve. It's good 30 years down the road. But if you want to save money in American health care, excuse me, you have to focus on these cases. And the good news from my slide a few, uh, few slides ago, there's enormous variation in chronic disease, uh, this congestive heart failure, CPD, cancer stroke. And we've shown from national evidence there's 20 to 40 percent savings opportunity. So if you save 20 to 40 percent on a 50 to 100 thousand dollar case, you can really bend the American cost curve. And part of what we've done, for example, in our when a patient gets readmitted to a hospital, they're likely to get readmitted for about 10, 11 days. And it's about roughly in a place like Chicago or Penn, it's about 5,000 a day. You get readmitted 10 days, 5,000, 50,000. Do the math. A $50,000 case when they get readmitted. So you want to make sure you keep those readmissions uh, down. So to me, we're American medicine, where whether it's Penn or Mass General, Hopkins, Duke, Chicago should focus is what can they do to bring down the cost of these curves. And I think we're uniquely a place to do that because we have doctors, nurses, social workers, pharmacists, and common electronic records all under one roof. And our strategy is a little hard to see. So at the base of this pyramid, you have your healthy patients. Again, important is a moral cause, but not where the money is. All the money is up here. This is where American health care costs are. So we, you know, for the healthy patients, we have our primary care network. And as you move up the, you know, into your chronic conditions, uh, uh, as both you know, Dr. Siegel and all the other doctors inside the room know in due time. Uh, in fact, Mark once taught me, you know, the average patient at, at Chicago or Penn uh, that we really work is someone who's like 74 years old and has got you know, diabetes and hypertension and BMI of 40. Those are the patients that cost all the money. So you have to figure out how to manage those populations. And one of the things we've really done that's enormous importance here, it's hard to see, we have a common electronic record every place we are. Our hospitals, our outpatient setting, our home care, common electronic, no matter where you come into the 200 miles and pen, you're going to be in a common record. You know, it's epic like you have. You know, we have it everywhere. So we can manage your care from the moment you walk in the door and, and know what meds you're on, uh, what images your doctors know. It's all uh, right there. And, so we've, and we've also organized ourselves 
into service lines and disease teams, the average patient doesn't know he, needs an, he or she needs a neurologist or a neurosurgeon. They know they had a stroke, or they know they have lower back pain, or they know they, ha they have breast cancer. So we organize ourselves by cancer, heart disease, neurosciences. So our teams now, we take the classic academic departments of medicine, surgery, orthopedics, et cetera, ophthalmology, we organize them all by disease teams as a way of organizing around patient populations. So the theme of this, as I've tried to develop, is this is a multifaceted approach where you have both regional uh, distribution to take care of patients where they are. You focus a lot on quality, as we have through our academy, and brought uh, the, both the, the mortality rates to a national low and patient satisfaction. You develop bundles for payers to kind of share the expertise and give them some payment relief. You work on readmissions. You work on uh, variation. And these things, you have to work on all those things to really make a distinctive difference and cause society to keep saying, well, we, we want what Chicago and Penn can offer you. And for example, these are compli co cases without complications cost about one third, one fourth what cases of complications do. So you have to focus on quality, bring down hospital quality conditions, bring down those collapses and UTIs and all those things that you know about as medical students and nurses. And you bring those down you bring your costs down enormously. And this is, say, it's 40,000 cases of complications, 10,000. This, this difference in, 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 uh, in cost curves is, again, one of the things that academic medical centers can really focus on. We focus a lot on the coordination of care. We, for example, we sign people up. Uh, there's a feature in Epic uh, called, you know, my chart. We call it pen chart. And we have five, over 500,000 people who now can sign up and just look at their you know, look at their lab tests and their images and their doctor's notes every day. It allows you to really manage your care. And then we you know, communicate with your care team, manage your appointments, renew prescriptions. Make it easy. Make it easy for the patient to manage their care. We've invested enormously in telemedicine, whether it's, you know, monitoring patients inside the IU. I'm trying to rush up a little bit so we have a few moments for questions. Uh, so we have the electronic monitoring of the intensive care unit uh, to remote monitoring of Parkinson's, and we even do telegenetics around the world, and same thing with dermatology, and we follow transplant. So having telemedicine, make it easy. You know, your hospital, like our hospital, is full every day. So if you have a patient come from 80 miles away who has Parkinson's, and you know, somebody, some adult child has to you know, take the mom or dad in to bring them down 80 miles to see us, we now do that through telemedicine as a way of making it easier for patients to come see us. This Dutch word is uh, obviously a tribute to the University of Chicago based on the, the book that came out from Cass Sunstein and Richard Fowler. We developed the first Nudge unit in, uh, in, in medicine. I know there's 200, I think David Nelson, I think about 200 of these are around the world right now. We were the first one to develop it. A good University of Chicago product, Rain and Merchant, uh, heads our Center for Digital Health. And we've t basically taken the lessons from Silicon Valley and learn how to try things out fast. You learn, this, you learn this Silicon Valley jargon of try fast and fail fast. You just try things out. And one of the things you do, you know, academic medicine is kind of wedded to process, uh, rightfully so. But in patient care delivery, you have to try things out a lot faster. So one of the things we've done, we've created about a 60-person innovation center that's made up of doctors, nurses, but also biostatistician, design experts, social workers, engineers, and they basically are kind of innovative lab. So we, whether it's things like quick recovery after, uh, after surgery uh, to prescribing uh, of generics, we have them you know, try out experiments like that, and then we try to bring them to the operating unit quite fast. So we basically mimic this off a of Silicon Valley uh, uh, ethos. And the nudge unit, for example, about three years ago, um, we realized that uh, we had generic prescribing about 65% of the time. Now, an electronic record, when a doctor or, or whoever can prescribe, the first thing that comes up in the drop-down menu is a generic. We've gotten to, overnight, we went from 65% to 99% generic prescribing inside the hospital, where there's a biosimilar. So 99% generic prescribing overnight by making that nudge. And we've um, done the same thing on opioid, you know, with the opioid crisis around the country. We, like a lot of people, routinely, three, four years ago, were handing out 30-day you know, prescriptions for opioids, and now we limit it to five or less. So when, you, when anybody prescribes opioids now, the first nudge is to say, 
maybe one day, maybe three days, maybe five days, and there's an enormous difference in prescribing just those simple nudges. The doctor can solve a right, but just a simple nudge like that makes an enormous difference in terms of patient care. So, to sum up where I've taken you today, um, it's both a strategy business and execution business. Part of what I'm proud of is that we focus a lot, whether it's through training, on what you actually do. A lot of people around academic medicine think, once you announce a strategy, it's self executes I learned a long time ago, strategy is never self execute You have to figure out whether you're running a sports team or a medical center. Really focus on, on, on implementation. Train people to do the right uh, thing. The burden of proof on value, to go back to those cost curves, I showed you that the American population has not had a, on average, a compensation increase except for health care benefits the last 20 years, that can't continue. And whether they vote for Mr. Trump in 2016 or 2020, they're rebelling in terms of the cost of health care costs. So we have to keep figuring out how we provide value. The consolidation and disruption, I didn't speak a lot about hospital consolidation today, because I think you have that covered in other talks. That disruption from the private sector is going to continue. When you have 18% of the American economy inside healthcare, the Amazons, the Googles, the Apples are going to keep coming to healthcare. And we have to then figure out how much are they really going to disrupt uh, healthcare versus it being once more a, a passing cycle. We figure it out. Uh, we haven't opened up walk-in clinics, but we basically figured out you had to put a care where the patients live. So you have your main academic hospitals you have here, but then a primary care and multi-special care everywhere so people can get to you within 10, 15 uh, miles. And where we, we think we've really shown the difference and the bundles are part of our economic model is, we think the total cost, it may be more expensive to go to Chicago and Penn for, for the first day, but by the fact that we diagnose you right, that we do genetic testing to make sure you're not put into chemotherapy if it's not gonna work for you, you know, if you have a BRCA mutation. So but we've been able to show our insurers in heart failure and cancer diagnosis and so forth, we'll save you 30% by doing the right diagnosis the first time. So they come back to say, if you're so sure about that, take the risk. We'll say, we'll take the risk that we can prove it. The readmissions program was part of us taking the risk that we could bring down those costs by 20, 30%. Uh, so we think now managing care 60 days, 90 days, 180 days, maybe a year at a time is the right way for us to go because we have the, the great academic medical center with the ICUs, we have the distributed primary care, we have special care, we have home care, and we have a common electronic record everywhere. We think that's the way to go in terms of the American population. I showed the slides on reducing variation of care, where a case with complications will cost three, four times what a case without complications does. Really focus on that. And that requires trust among doctors and nurses that you know, we're using the data to improve patient care rather than just to monitor them uh, too much. And the investments in technology and innovation have to continue. I mean, the, we're a generation in which our young doctors, you know, Kenneth, I know, you know, we have like a, a pen now, 10, 15% of our graduating doctors from, from the medical school, they don't go to practice. They're going to app development. They're going to work for Google, uh, uh, they're developing 100 apps a year. So increasingly, medical expertise is being going into that kind of software world. I'm worried that we'll once more have a cacophony of apps uh, to the, go over the cacophony of paper records that we dealt with 20, 30 years ago. But we have to deal with technology. But at our core, I think, every decade that I've been in academic medicine, going back to 85 now, it's always been predicted that academic hospitals will have a difficult time, the community hospitals will, uh, will surpass them. And every decade, the academic hospitals are stronger than they were before. I think it's be fact be because we keep attracting the doctors, the nurses, the pharmacists, the social workers. As long as you have the care team being organized around the hospital and the community worker, the fact that we've done this for 500 years will continue to put us in good stead for the next decades as well. So it's a pleasure to be back with you. I spend many fun times in this room. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to comment. So I had a question about the 5% of yeah. patients that cost mm. the 50% of, or cause 50% mm. of costs. When they're shopping around for a procedure, assuming they are shopping around. Yeah, they're not. Um, yeah, if they're, if they're asking for a procedure mm. that's like way, way above their deductible, how do you make them actually care that the procedure costs less at the time? Well, for things, the L, a little less cost. My partner has breast or prostate cancer. Your children are 24 weeks, you know, uh, maturity at, at birth. And frankly, they're not in the middle of 
breast cancer, you're not going to start negotiating on your you know, iPhone for the cost of, of an MRI. That being said, we have to be attentive to, 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 the, uh, to those, uh, those costs. What we try to do is we try to show their insurance company, who's their agent, that we're better value over. So what we try to do with our Blue Cross and Aetna's is basically say, let us be a center of excellence in stroke. Let us be a center of excellence for high-risk births. Let us be a center of excellence in proton therapy. So we've tried to give them packages so the patient doesn't have to make that decision as she or he is coming into the hospital. Now, on the other hand, under Obamacare, you know, the, as, as, as important as, as, important as out, uh, out-of-pocket costs are, they're limited to $6,500 per patient and $13,000, and that's not, you know, most, many parts of the American population can't uh, afford that, uh, but there's Obamacare subsidies for that that Trump is trying to undo, so my politics are coming through. But by and large, um, on those cases, you know, for example, you know, we don't send anybody to bankruptcy and so forth, so you basically, you can negotiate those expensive cases. My, my point is, only the insurance companies do not know how to manage those complications. We do. The people inside this room not to manage those complications. We know how to do the right diagnosis. The insurance companies don't. So I think, in many ways, I think the insurance companies are going to go on to be like Visa, and they'll get their 3% off the top, but the care process will have to be managed by the people inside this room. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for your mm-hmm. comments. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jennifer, you yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right mm-hmm. yeah, I would like to comment on the patient yeah. Mm. Well, to go back to the example that Dr. Seeger gave me, you know, 20 years ago, uh, a patient who's 74 has these really there's asymmetric knowledge between what you know like it's one thing to be 28 be from tennis and i don't want to be too flippant about that it's another thing to be 70 and have four or five things going on and so i, I feel it's both our professional obligation and then our obligation as medical centers to figure out on behalf of those patients so even though i'm a big fan of the internet and so forth when the time comes there's too much you know garbage on the internet as well as reliable things so ultimately i think the, when somebody's seriously ill, they're going to rely on the doctor and the nurse to help them sort out all the stuff that's going on there. And knowing the right thing to do is not easy. And if there's that with four morbidities, there's a behavioral issue going on as well, uh, whether, it's, uh, whether it's depression or whether it's you know, uh, substance abuse. So di- you know, self-diagnosis is very difficult. In terms of these computer and I, I tried these computer apps out where you can get a doctor. Somebody says, oh, you're seriously, I'll go see a doctor. They're not. room text minutes okay if you if you like if you allow if you allow this generation to text their doctor every minute the doctors are crazy even kaiser now limits these texts to eight a month because they were getting too many people texting their caregivers every month so if you bring the price of health care down to zero you're going to demand even more of it so one of the things that people forget about when we brought in the walk-in clinics, they did not bring down primary care in the country. When we brought in urgent care, they did not bring down ED visits. Every big innovation in healthcare the last four years has been an add-on, not a substitute. And that's a big challenge for all of us inside the system. We keep adding on, which is why it's so I've written about this automated hovering health 
of our patients. What's going on? And uh, the last four or five years, all of us have now uh, with the opioid uh, crisis, and there's a lot of interventions one could do here uh, as well to help those patients. Oh, sure. David? Yeah. yeah. Ralph, so it was, I loved all the comments mm. you made about the real efficiencies yeah. that Penn has produced, yeah, yeah. but I, I want to go back to the slide you had about the margin. Yeah. Because the margin, of course, is the difference between the revenues yeah. you've gotten yeah. and, the, and, the, and the costs you've had. And I'm wondering what part of Penn's profitability is related to it, the rates it's able to negotiate. Yes. And, and in thinking about those rates you're able to negotiate, how important is PEB's market share, which I know has grown tremendously yeah. over the years. And just to sort of push one more level, to what extent do you think PEN's efficiencies have been a major driver of its ability to get that sort of market share? And, uh, and with that, sort of some of the less competitive um, potential competitors drifting out of the market. Yeah. Uh, David asked a, a multiple series of questions. Let me try to take them on. There's academic evidence, and I've written about this as well, that by and large, the big systems command better prices than less, and that's true. And we're one of those systems that gets better prices. Now, some of this is baked into legislation because I'll get a little jargony on it. Medicare hospital, teaching hospitals such as Chicago and Penn get an extra allowance uh, from the federal government on inpatient cases. That now case is worth about 25%, a case, 25%. It's, uh, it's called the IME adjustment. I've spent the last 30 years of my life going to Congress to make sure they don't take that away, uh, as Mr. Trump tried uh, to do. Uh, so part of that is in Medicare, we all get that extra add-on on inpatient cases. Secondly, on the blues and so forth, you try to have regional uh, market share. One of the reasons we did regional dis distribution and I've talked to Dr. Ponsky about this, you know, and I knew, I knew this when I get, got here 30 years ago. If you're sitting in the south side of Chicago, 37% 37, 37 Medicaid. When I was here, Blue Cross paid us five times as much for the same procedure as Medicaid did. You don't have to do advanced math to figure out if you're getting paid five times as much by Blue Cross as Medicaid, you better figure out how to get some Blue Cross patients in here. So you have to have regional programs like cancer, when I was here, cancer, GI, et cetera, that cause patients uh, to kind of come in. And, you know, a lot of, as, as you know, uh, even better than I, a lot of American healthcare is based more on your zip code than anything else. So, you know, the way we pay for American healthcare, which I showed in my first slide or two, is importantly powerful, and you have to figure out how to deal with that. And, you know, we're not as inner city based as, as, as Chicago is, but you have to figure out some way to get to the populations, which is why we distribute ourselves to multi specialty centers. Now, in terms, of what I'm proud of is, I knew that just having higher prices was not sustainable in the long term. I've hung around enough economists like you to know that. So one of the reasons we focused as much on quality and safety and so forth is we knew in the long term we had to prove that they got value. So and that's why I was willing to take the readmission risk, which is the only place in the country that's been willing to do that, because I knew that we had enough communities, you know, Shreya can go be social workers and so forth, we put them out there. And so we knew that that's a little inside baseball, but basically, if you basically do the community interventions, you can save money. So I think we've been able to show them that in heart failure and breast and lung and so forth, we can save them 30% by the better diagnosis. So you have to have better care in the long term. I think too many of the hospitals, Rob Burns and I have written about this, and it's in the Times again today, just get by with higher prices. That's not sustainable in the long term. Those higher prices are going away. Ralph, mm -hmm. yes. America Edison, mm -hmm. what would you do one thing that you would impose on all of us? Well, I'll give you a simple answer because we still live in a 50-state system and R and D's and blue and red and so forth. Uh, and I've been pushing this. I've moved Medicare to 55 uh, because we, we know, there's evidence that people who are not insured, when they get to Medicare at 65, they have a lot of you know, pent-up in a sense, disease, and they cost four or five times as much as somebody who's been continually insured. So, repeat that. If you get to 65 on Medicare, you're going to cost four or five times as much those first couple of years as somebody who's continually been insured and therefore having access to health care. So, if we can make that age of having availability of Medicare down to 55, just to give my, my example earlier, all of us are over 55. We're the ones who cost money. I don't think the country's going to go for Medicare for all despite you know, what uh, uh, Senator Warren and other people are uh, not, not going to go there. You know, there's not enough trust in government for the reasons I mentioned. You know, trust in government, 7%, trust in doctors, 85%. Uh, so my sense is 
It's not a big kind of sexy solution to do Medicare at 55. Uh, um, Clinton proposed that and got washed out in the whole 97, 98 crisis. I wish we had done it then. Uh, one of my friends on the board at, at Penn has been doing a lot of polling around the country with Governor Rendell. And this is the most uh, salient issue among working class and Democratic voters. My guess is, I'll predict here today, if, the, if we have the Democratic president in 2000, you're going to get Medicare at 55. This one really resonates. So, I mean, there's other big things you could do, but I think with 50 states, 320 metropolitan areas, employer-based health insurance, R's and D's and blue states and all that kind of stuff, you can't do one big solution. I mean, Obamacare came as close to as you could do, and you see the kind of rebellion against that. You know, Florida and Texas still don't have Medicaid expansion to show you how ridiculous things are inside this country. So to me, Medicare 55 is the thing that I would push as a, a solution. And what's nice about that, the, the, the Republicans will go for that, especially, again, inside base. If you do it through Medicare Advantage, rather, which has private sector involvement as well as public sector funding, if you do it through Medicare Advantage, the R's will like us. And the, the D's will like the 55, and the R's will like Medicare Advantage. Again, using a little jargon there. But I've been around Washington long enough to know you have to have solutions that get both the R's and, and, and the D's on it. So Medicare 55 is my solution to that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, in terms of moral theory in Obamacare, it, keeping people, well, obviously once you have, you're diagnosed, diagnosed with cancer, you want to make sure you have access to health care. But for example, I mentioned earlier, you know, do what your mom told you, don't smoke. So for example, one of our behavioral economists, doctors, you know, like our version of David Meltzer, he had a study at GE about 10 years ago where they gave the GE, General Electric, uh, gave GE employees incentive to not smoke. Now, it's very hard to stop smoking, but basically, but then all of a sudden GE said, these, these people are 28 and 29 and 31. They're not going to be working for me when they're 55 and 57 when they get lung cancer. So GE stopped saying, I'm not going to pay for somebody who's 28 uh, a, a kind of annual payment to not smoke because the savings from that person is going to be when he or she is 55. And when they're 55, you know, in the gig economy, they're not going to be working for me. So one of the real challenges with employer-based health care, I'll, I'll get more narrative here, is the companies do not want to pay for somebody who's going to be on somebody else's tab five years from now. And one of the great challenges in wellness and preventive health is basically the cost of they're not doing the right thing, exercising, eating, smoking, and so forth, comes 10 years down the road. So to go to pre-existing conditions, now obviously when it's more advanced, such as already being di diagnosed with cancer or being hypertensive and so forth, you, you, Obamacare uh, fortunately still protects us on that. In terms of the cost curve, obviously, though, some of those things may be 10, 15 years out. In a government-paid system like the UK and Canada, you're more likely to be willing to pay for those kind of things than you are in, in the US kind of system. So I think one of the failures, that's why we have to make sure, despite what Mr. Trump said, they keep the pre-existing conditions part of the policy. But I think one of the general challenges to doing the right thing with 20 and 30-year-olds is that essentially at age 50, they're going to be working for somebody else. And the company says, well, I'm not going to pay for that. Well, first, uh, by fail fast, this is a kind of jogging from Saga. First of all, we're doing this 10, 15 patients at a time. So, I mean, it's not like we're doing it 1,000 patients at a time. You try it out. So, for example, uh, you know, whether it's getting people uh, to, you know, check their blood pressure or take their medications, you try out different ways. Of, uh, and we found that texting is a good way of getting, staying in touch with people. So, it's better patient care as well. So, it's not just the profit maximizing because in a world of bundles and so forth, uh, you, one, uh, in some ways, obviously has economic benefit, but also keeping people out of hospitals, keeping people on their medications, uh, keeping people uh, you know, healthy is, is a good thing morally. It's not just an economic thing. So by and large, you know, hospitals for 50 years 
have been the most expensive part of the health system. I showed you the 30% slide. That's a little reduced from where it was 34 years ago. Keeping people out of hospitals is what most people have figured out is how you bring money, take money out of healthcare. So whereas reducing readmissions, uh, making sure you reduce the, uh, the hospital acquired infection so you don't have complications. Those are things you want to experiment on. And those are good for patients as well as economic. So now, by and large, a lot of our efforts at economic improvement are also efforts to bring quality up. So I think, I think that there's a moral uh, kind of overlap there. Listen, thank you. To be, it's great to be back here.